In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. So wel welcome again. Um, this is our uh, first in a long time once a month gathering um, outside of Lent. Uh, this is really our goal, like I said, to get together once, once a month, get to know one another as catechumens, and have an opportunity for some in-person teachings and, and serve, so for some questions. So I'm not, as I said, I'm not really sure what we'll do with the catechumen class next, next year or come the fall, but because we're outside of the catechumen classes when we're only meeting once a month, because that's so infrequent, at the end of today, I'm going to open up to questions, but if you have questions that are not about our topic today of fasting, feel free to ask anything you want. Okay, so I'm just gonna open it up to just whatever questions you have. Now again, I'm gonna to try to keep the talk relatively short, but there's a lot to talk about with fasting. So what we'll do today is um, do a little bit of a review and expansion of one of the catechumen lectures that we recorded last year online. That's catechumen lecture number 10. And in number 10, one of the topics of the three or four that were talked about in that lecture was fasting. And so this is obviously a pretty relevant talk, right? Because we're in the midst of Lent. We've got one more week of Lent, and then we have Holy Week and then Pascha. And so we've been fasting already for five weeks. But Orthodox Christians, as you know, fast throughout the year to various degrees. And sometimes it's just two days a week, Wednesdays and Fridays. Sometimes it's for extended periods. Great and Holy Lent is typically the longest period of fasting, but it's not always. And we'll, we'll talk about that in just a second. So when you look at the Orthodox calendar, about half the days of the year are fasting days. So obviously fasting is a really important thing. But I'll tell you, one of the questions I get most often, not from catechumens, but from Orthodox Christians who have been Orthodox sometimes for many years, is why do we fast? And they say, I don't understand. I just don't get it. I don't get why we do this. And what happens when you don't understand it? You don't really participate that much. Ideally, we have the humility to say, boy, the church has been doing this for 2,000 years. There must be some wisdom in it. Even if I don't understand it, I'm just going to do it. And in orthodoxy, that's really the approach we take. We don't seek to understand something fully and then do it because there's a lot that's a mystery. We seek to do it and then to form some understanding. And a lot of times when we, when we do it that way, the understanding we form is not something we can always put into words. This is just the nature of, of the faith and theology, is that sometimes we know something deep within the heart, but we can't really put it into words. That's the ideal, okay? But for various reasons, people really kind of run into issues with fasting, especially. And so today we'll talk about where fasting came from and why we do it, and hopefully you'll have a better understanding of it. And hopefully also, not just a better understanding, but a, a greater fervor for it. That's really what I, what I want to instill in you today. I want you to see fasting not as something to do out of obligation, but something you desire to do out of love. Because fasting is actually a really beautiful thing and it's a gift, and we'll, we'll talk about that. So again, about half the days of the year we, we fast. What do these include? These include Wednesdays and Fridays. Why Wednesdays? Wednesday is the day that Judas decided to betray Christ. And so out of sorrow for that, knowing that we participated in that, we, we betray Christ every time we sin, we fast on Wednesdays. And on Fridays, Christ was crucified. So we participate in repentance for that as well, because when we see Christ crucified, we have to recognize we put him up on the cross. We sinned. If man did not sin, Christ did not need to be crucified. He may have still become incarnate, that's what St. Maximus the Confessor says, out of love, to, to fully unite humanity with divinity in his person. But the crucifixion came about because we sin. And whether we sinned before he was crucified or after, we participate in that that excludes, by the way, Wednesdays and Fridays, we fast every week of the year, except for there's a few fast-free weeks, and we're about to have one. So after Pascha, we have a fast-free week, on that, what we call Bright Week, and that, that whole week is almost treated as one day, like the glorious eighth day of eternity, and so there's no fasting during that week. Then, there are a few particular feasts on which we fast. That includes the Eve of Theophany, so Theophany is January 6th, so on the 5th we fast. The beheading of John the Baptist is a strict fast day on August 29th, and the Feast of the Elevation of the Cross on September 14th. Then we have the four major fast periods. So the first is Great and Holy Lent. Now, it's actually a little bit more complex than people realize because there's one week of fasting before the fast begins, but it's a partial fast, and it's, it's, a, it's a meat fast, so there's no meat. So you can continue to have dairy that last week before Great and Holy Lent begins, but no meat. And then we have 48 days, 48 days. So it's 40 days, which will end next Friday. Then we have a two-day bridge of Lazarus Saturday and Palm Sunday. 
and then we have Monday through Saturday of Holy Week. So that adds up to 48 days from Clean Monday through Holy Saturday of fasting. Then we have the Nativity Fast, which is 40 days before the Nativity, and the Dormition Fast, which is the first 14 days of August before the Feast of the Dormition of the Theotokos, or the Falling Asleep or Death of the Theotokos. And finally, we have the Apostles Fast. This one's a little complex. The Apostles Fast ends on the feast of the Apostles Peter and Paul, our parish feast day, on August, or on, excuse me, on June 29th. But it begins at different times. And the reason it begins at different times is it always begins a week after the Feast of Pentecost. Well, Pentecost takes place 50 days after Pascha, and Pascha is a movable feast. It's not always in the same day of the year. So if you have a really late Pascha, the Apostles' Fast may be, like last year, one day. And if you have a really early Pascha, the Apostles' Fast may be longer than Lent. We had one that was about 50 days. Okay, now people groaned. Oh my goodness, we're going to fast. But again, fasting is a gift. This is how we should see it. And so it really depends from year to year. And so from every year, you, have, you kind of have to look and see how long the Apostles' Fast actually is. There are various types of fasting. Okay, fasting is not just one thing. The first type is the complete fast. The complete fast takes place when we have no food and no water at all. There's one day a year that almost everybody, almost everybody except for children, typically partakes of this fast. What day is that? Anybody know? Holy Friday. Holy Friday, it's a very normal thing for Orthodox Christians not to eat or drink anything. And that's coming up, obviously, in, in, uh, in just two weeks. There's then a complete food fast. A complete food fast takes place when we have no food, but we still drink liquids. Typically just water, maybe some tea and coffee. Okay. Now these are, are not prescribed by the church. They're done typically with a blessing. If you want to fast like that on Holy Friday, go for it. You don't need a blessing for that. That's pretty normative. But some people like to do this during Lent. And some people like to do this, especially for the first three days of Lent, before the pre-sanctified liturgy on Wednesday evening. So clean Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. They don't eat or drink anything. It's a good thing to get a blessing for beforehand. And I've had people ask me for things like, someone said, I'd like to do a, a, a food fast and just drink water. And I said, for how long? And they said, the 40 days. And I said, no, <laughs> that's not going to happen. You're not quite there yet. You need to slow down on that. So we need to kind of know our strength and know what we can handle. But if you want to do one of those fasts, it's actually a really beautiful exercise, but you need to have weaned yourself into it and you need a blessing for that. Okay. Then there's the dry fast. A dry fast is eating only dry, uncooked foods. And typically when people do a dry fast, it's only once a day after sunset. So a lot of people, if you look at the, the early canons, this is actually what the Lenten fast should be, is only eating once a day after sunset. Now, most of us don't have the strength for that. And so again, if you're, if you're not doing that, don't worry about it. Not a lot of people do. However, as you strengthen yourself in fasting, as you go along, you may say, you know what? Eating vegan alone is not really doing it for me anymore. That's too easy. I'm not really feeling any, any sort of strain. There's, there's no difficulty in this. I don't feel like I'm really denying myself any, any of this. So I need something tougher. And what you can do is you can cut out a meal. Maybe you eat two meals a day. And you may find that that's just really easy too. And so you go to one meal a day. It's not a bad thing to do. Then there's, there's the fourth type, which is a lightened fast. A lightened fast happens on the Feast of the Annunciation, which we just had, and it happens on the weekends of Lent, where wine and oil and sometimes fish are allowed. So still no meat and dairy, but wine and oil and fish, and sometimes fish are allowed. And then finally, there's the conventional fast, which is no meat, no dairy, uh, no wine, no wine, no oil, and no fish. You can have shellfish. We'll, we'll talk about wine in a second, um, but uh, that's the typical Wednesday and Friday fast. And what you want to do is you want to have a good Orthodox calendar. Obviously, we order some every single year, and we sell those in the bookstore. And those tell you exactly what what each fast day consists of. You'll notice that during Great and Holy Lent, besides Palm Sunday and and uh, the Annunciation, there are no days for fish. But the Nativity fast is a much lighter fast. Fish is allowed, you know, multiple times every single week. And so you have to look at the calendar to know exactly what type of fast we're in. So the question obviously is, well, then why do we fast? Where did fasting come from? And what do we hope to gain in fasting? What is fasting really about? And, and this is what we're going to talk about today. This is what we'll answer. Before we get into the specific topic of fasting, though, we have to understand the basis of fasting. And the basis and foundation of fasting is what we call asceticism. Why do we practice asceticism? What is asceticism actually about? From the time of the apostles until today, Orthodox Christians have lived ascetic lives. And the church has called us to live ascetic lives. Asceticism 
comes from the Greek word oskesis. And oskesis is a word that quite literally translated means training. It's the literal word that an athlete or Olympian or one who is going to fight in the arena would use for their training. They would say they're practicing oskesis, and this is where Christians took the term from. When we train physically, we often have an opponent, right? So if I'm gonna, if, if, let's say I wrestle. If I wrestle, when I train, I train better if I have an opponent. If I just imagine somebody, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna train very well, so I have an opponent. In the Christian life, we have two opponents. The first opponent are the demons. And the second opponent are the passions. And the passions consist in man of what St. Paul calls the old man, the old man within us, or the man of sin. So asceticism, asceticism is a very biblical concept. It is absolutely found throughout the Old and New Testaments. There's an article that I highly recommend you read. You can readily find it online. And if you want to read about the ascetic ideal in the New Testament, well, guess what? That's the name of the article. The Ascetic Ideal and the New Testament, Reflections on the Critique of the Theology of the Reformation. It's by Father George Florovsky. So, again, The Ascetic Ideal and the New Testament by Father George Florovsky. This is a phenomenal, incredible article in which he goes through every book of the New Testament and takes out the verses that shows that asceticism is built into the very fabric of the New Testament, and it's the call of the Christian. It's a lengthy article, but it's well worth your time. It's a, it's a very, very good article. So, without going into everything that Father George goes into, let's at least look at some of what St. Paul tells us about asceticism and where we can find asceticism and what that means, what it really means for us in the New Testament. So first, let's look to Galatians 5, verses 16 to 25, where we'll see these this explanation of what the spiritual life is about. In these verses, St. Paul says this, I say this, walk by the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. What the fallen flesh desires is against the Spirit, and the Spirit is against the flesh. And these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you desire. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. They are adultery, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, idolatry, the practice of magic, hatred, strife, selfish ambitions, outbursts of angers, rivalries, divisions, heresies, envies, murders, excess drinking, orgies, and similar things. About these I warn you, as I have done in the past, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. On the other hand, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and lusts. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. It's a really, really important chapter of St. Paul's. So in Galatians 5, St. Paul clearly describes two ways of life, of life which he describes as being wholly opposed to one another. One is to live by the flesh, which is to follow after sin. And by the way, notice when he says to live by the flesh, he doesn't just talk about sins of the body. He includes things like anger and rivalries, it, being self-willed. He includes these as, being, as living by the flesh. And opposed to this is living according to the Spirit. In various places, you'll see living according to the flesh described uh, in St. Paul as, as different things. Some, in some places, it's living according to the flesh. In other places, he calls it the old man or the old self, or sometimes just the way of sin. All of these describe the same type of thing. When we are, we believe we're free, but really we're a slave to the passions and the sin within us. We can't control these things. That's why self-control is part, part of the living by the Spirit. So we think we're free, but we can't help but not we, we can't help help ourselves in looking at at, uh, at good-looking people of the opposite sex we can't help but getting drunk we can't help ourselves in getting anger a lot of times people come to me in confession they say this they say father i, I it's like it's like it's another person I, I can't i can't help myself when i do this and i actually like when they say that when they say it feels like another person i go it's exactly what saint paul is talking about 
St. Paul tells you don't identify with that. That's the old man, the man of sin. Where is he drowned? In the waters of baptism. But he tries to claw his way back. And so when you notice yourself overtaken by these things, it shows you the roots of the passions are really deep. And sometimes they take over, and you don't feel like yourself, and you're not really yourself. He's saying, don't give way to that person. Don't let that person have free reign. We have to do something about that. What do we do? Asceticism. And opposed to that, obviously, is the way of the Spirit. And when we live the way of the Spirit, we're cultivating the virtues in us, in our, uh, ourselves instead. And when we cultivate the virtues, sin, those deep roots, start to wither. And it starts to go away. So this is the idea that St. Paul gives us. If you cultivate the virtues and the way of the Spirit, all that sin within you, baptism doesn't just make it go away. What baptism does is it causes grace to be imputed to you so that as you grow grace, that sin withers and withers and withers and eventually is eradicated completely. But it's a process. It takes time. Okay, so let's, let's talk about this a little bit more. The same ideas are described in Colossians. Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 to 10. Therefore, put to death what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, depraved passions, lust and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming to the children of disobedience. You also used to live in them when you lived among these people, but now put them all away, anger, rage, evil, slander, and shameful language. Do not lie to one another. You have put off the old self with his doings, and you have put on the new self who is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of his creator. So once again, St. Paul shows a very clear opposition between the old self and the new self. The idea here is that if we feed the man of the flesh, we strengthen him. In other words, when, when we, when we uh, submit to the man of the flesh and these calls for sin, we strengthen him, we feed him, and he becomes stronger. And suddenly fighting that passion becomes even more difficult. Sometimes to the point where it becomes almost seemingly impossible. What we do is we give the old man within us, that man of sin, a louder voice in our lives. And when that voice becomes louder, the man of the spirit has a voice that is weakened and quieted and drowned out. If, however, we starve the man of the flesh, if we refuse and even fall out of love with comfort and entertainment, which is what the man of the flesh is always looking for, then we can look to spiritual joys and feed the man of the spirit instead. The question is, why would we want to do this? Why would we want to do this? Is Christianity masochistic? It says that everything that you desire, just get rid of. Just deny yourself these things. Turn off all the entertainment. Get rid of social media. Stop feeding yourself the food that you want to feed yourself. You may be tired, but do prostrations anyway until you're exhausted. You may have other things you want to do, but you have to go pray before your icons. Well, if you look at it in these terms, you have to, have to, have to. Yeah, it's pretty miserable. Of course... We don't want to do it just out of have to. We'll talk about that at the end. But what's the point? Is it just because we hate ourselves and we don't think that we, we deserve a little relaxation every now and then? It has nothing to do with that. It's rather about this. Material comforts only comfort us for the moment, right? As an example, you're having a bad day. You're tired. You have a lot of nervousness, anxiety. And you say, oh, I just, I just, I can't do it anymore. I'm going to grab my gallon of ice cream and I'm just going to scoop away until I feel better. And you eat it. Then do you feel better? First couple bites feel pretty good. Especially if it has Oreos in it. That's what I believe. <laughs> <laughs> but you eat more and more of it. All that anxiety and stress, did you really get rid of it? No. All you did was cover over it for a moment. <clears throat> and then, if you ate too much, the stomach bug settles in and you feel sick outwardly and inwardly, or even if you made yourself outwardly feel good, <coughs> eventually you get hungry again, and suddenly all that inward angst is still there. Did you really deal with it? No. Did you heal it? No. What did you do? You simply masked it. <coughs> you covered over it. You think about maybe when you're really angry at your spouse, and you feel that righteous indignation, and you let him have it. I can't believe you did this again. Do you feel good when you're done with that? 
No, you feel really miserable. And then you have trouble looking at yourself in the mirror. You go, oh, I'm an idiot. I'm an idiot. We do this again and again and again, where we look for these comfort things. A big one, for, for especially for young men today, even some young girls, video games. I'm gonna numb myself, just getting into a different world and going to this fantasy. And then what happens? Two, three hours into it, you put the controller down and go, what did I just do with my life? I feel empty, I feel lost. So what am I gonna do about that? I know, I'm gonna mask it again and go play more video games or watch a movie. Or, and we go from one thing, and by the way, the modern world teaches us to do this constantly. That's what social media is all about. Keep scrolling, keep getting those dopamine hits and never really deal with yourself. And so do we see proof of this in society today? Yeah, social media use is way up. And what else is up? Anxiety, depression, and suicides. People are having these, these major crises because they're constantly trying to just cover over, over themselves and they say, but this makes me feel good. It makes you feel good for the moment, but it doesn't actually answer the deeper longings of your heart. That's the mistake of constantly feeding the old man. And we fed the old man so much that that voice is really, really loud. But we keep becoming hungry again, and he wants more, and he wants more, and he wants more. This is the lie of the devil, by the way. The devil says, oh, just, just, just do this. Do this for yourself. You need some me time. And yeah, maybe this is considered sinful, but you're going to feel good. I promise you're going to feel good. And then you do it, and for the moment, it feels good. And then afterwards you go, well, now I feel like junk again. In fact, I feel even worse than I did before. And the devil says, well, don't worry. You can do it again. <laughs> Just do it again. And maybe that time you're going to feel fulfilled. That time you'll feel good about yourself and you do it. You feel miserable again. Right? And so we see this happen again and again and again. Another example I constantly use with people, listen to a new music album. Right? When I was growing up in the 90s when music was still pretty good, I'd get the new album. <laughs> And I go, man, this is like, I'm never going to listen to anything else. This is it. This is the greatest thing. I was all excited about it. I want to learn all about every song. And of course, after you listen to it like the 80th time, you grow tired of it. And then you go, well, I got to buy a new album. Well, if this stuff really fulfilled the deepest, deepest longings of the heart, we wouldn't grow tired of it. It'd fill us and we would, would remain filled. But we never remain actually filled. We always find that in the end we're empty again. It's the heart that yearns for deeper and fuller things. So we have to break our addictions to the comforts desired by the man of the flesh and instead learn to be filled with spiritual joys. But here's the question. Is that transformation not feeding but starving the man of the flesh? Not starving but feeding the man of the spirit? Is that an easy transition to go from one to the other? Well, we know it's not. <laughs> we know it's not. And, and St. Paul tells us so much in Romans 7. Again, St. Paul answers everything about this here. Romans 7, verses 18 and 19. Thus I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. You notice when he uses the word flesh here, he doesn't mean your skin. He means the fleshly man. In my flesh, nothing good dwells because although the power of will is present within me, I do not find it doing what is good. In fact, the good which I desire, I do not do. But the evil which I do not desire, that is what I do. Relatable? Pretty relatable. The things that we don't want to do, we end up doing. The things that we really want to do, we can't get ourselves to do. Why? Because that old man is constantly screaming, what about me, what about me, what about me? So what do we do? For this, for a final few verses, let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. Do you not know that those who run in a race with everyone else, run with everyone else, but that only one receives the prize? Run like that in order to win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. Now, they do it in order to receive a corruptible crown. But we seek an incorruptible crown. This is how I run, not without a goal. This is how I fight, not beating the air. Instead, I chastise my body and bring it unto submission. For fear that after having preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. These are really important verses. Let me grab my water here. Really important verses. What's he talking about here? He says, just because you're a Christian, he says, when you watch, watch a race, everyone's in the race. But it's only one who actually receives the crown. And he says, run like that. In other words, don't just say, well, I'm baptized and therefore eh, I'm done. It's good enough. 
I'm going to shoot for the bare minimum in the Christian life. He says, no, run the Christian race as if you really want to win it. He says, those who just want to, to, to uh, compete in, in these games, the best they can do, they practice self-control in everything when they train. What they eat, how much they sleep, intimacy with others, they put aside for the time of training. They are tough on themselves. And at most, all they get is a corruptible crown. It's a crown, a little laurel made of plants. And it's put on their head if there's one winner, and he basks in it, and within a week it shrivels up and dies. He says, you're going to compete for an incorruptible crown, a crown of glory that's going to be on you for all eternity. So we should do the same thing. And he says, this is how I do it. He says, I, I run not, a, not as one without a goal. In other words, can you imagine if there's no finish line and a bunch of people at the start of the, uh, of the race, I say, okay, go! And they're like, everyone's running scattered. But there's no finish line. Sometimes we, we live the Christian life like this, he's saying. He says, don't do that. Have a goal in mind. That goal is holiness and purity of heart. And strive for that goal. Ask yourself, what's keeping me from getting there? What are the obstacles and what can I do about them? Which is why we read ascetic literature. And then he, he compares himself to a boxer. A boxer who's not paying attention is going to swing his arms and just hit the air. He says, no, you need to know what your target is. And who does he say his target is? Himself. He says, I chastise my body and bring it into submission. Why in the world would you do that? The reason is because within the body he sees the old man constantly crying out and distracting him from spiritual joys. As I said, this is a tough, tough transition. It's a very tough transition to go from feeding the body and the, the man of the flesh to feeding the soul. Because at first the spiritual life isn't really full of a bunch of joys and peace and love and, and beauty. It's just full of difficulty. Because our focus is all on this, on what we're not doing for ourselves anymore. You're telling me I can't just sit down and play video games for 10 hours? You're telling me I can't look at pornography? You're telling me I can't curse out everyone who cuts me off on the road? You're telling me I can't just go, what about me, what about me, what about me? Well, that's miserable at first because we're used to it. And so it becomes a lot about what we're denying ourselves. And fasting becomes very much early on about what you're not eating. St. Paul's reminding us that if we have this great goal and we feed the man of the spirit, eventually those things actually turn into spiritual joy. And suddenly, the yearnings of the heart, which are much deeper than the yearnings of the man of the flesh, those become fulfilled. And suddenly, we feel at peace. And we go, man, I don't need those things. In fact, I don't even want those things anymore. I just don't want them anymore. They don't do anything for me. If anything, they kind of break my relationship with Christ, and that makes me miserable. I want to go after spiritual things. So, St. Paul talks about how he subdues, in other words, the man of the flesh. And again, while this is a very difficult and painful and even torturous task at first, in time, the, f the heart finds purity and begins to bask in the experience of spiritual things. And this is what asceticism is about. It is saying no to the sin within us and the ego within us. In other words, it means denying ourselves. You sit there and go, well, you're telling us we have to deny those things within us? I'm not telling you that. Who told you that? Christ did. Christ himself said it. If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. This is Christ's command to us. By the way, when people ask me, when they come from other Christian traditions, why Orthodox Christianity is ascetic, I tell them, do you know what asceticism is? That verse right there, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me, is the best definition for asceticism I've ever read. That's it. That's the whole of it. Because we want to follow after Christ, and we can't follow after Christ if we're always falling after the old man. This self-denial is neither passive nor easy. It is active and difficult. If the Christian life doesn't feel difficult, increase your asceticism. But it is our call in the gospel. It may not be passive or easy. It may be active and difficult, but it is our call from the gospel. So with this, as a long introduction, obviously, but I think necessary, let's look at fasting in the scriptures and begin to talk about how fasting plays into our asceticism. 
So where do we find fasting in the scriptures? I'm going to quote a lot of St. Basil because of, to prepare for this, I read his two famous homilies on fasting. But he's, he's just one of many, many fathers who notes a lot of the examples of fasting we find in the scripture. I'm just going to give you some of them. And he's one of the, one of the main ones who notes that fasting is mankind's very first commandment from God. It's the very first commandment, right? God, as you know, in the garden of paradise in Eden, tells Adam and Eve that they can eat of any fruit within the garden except for the fruit of knowledge of good and evil. And thus the first commandment given was one telling Adam and Eve what not to eat. It's a commandment of fasting. Fasting then became immediately connected with the subject of obedience to God. And furthermore, the fathers talk about how Adam and Eve lived an almost angelic life, an angelic existence in paradise. So because angels have no need of food, fasting is also associated with the angelic life. This is why on a typical week, when we're not in a fast period, the lady fast on Wednesdays and Fridays. Monastics fast one extra day. What day is that? Monday. Mondays. Because every single day, there's a commemoration of the seven days of the week. Every Sunday we know is a commemoration of the resurrection. Every Monday is a commemoration of the angels. And so in imitation of the angels, monastics will fast also on Mondays. So where else do we see fasting in the Old Testament? St. Basil points out that Esau sold his birthright to Jacob for what? For a meal in Genesis 25, using this as an example of harming oneself by not fasting. In Exodus, fasting for 40 days and nights caused Moses to become strong and bold to enter the deep darkness of the cloud on the mount and made him worthy to receive the tablets of the Ten Commandments written by the very finger of God. Then, while fasting prepared Moses to receive the law, it was the foregoing of abstinence and fasting and the enacting of revelry that caused the Israelites to fall into idolatry and drunkenness. One fasted, the others did not. Hannah, in 1 Samuel 1, combined prayer with fasting before she finally conceived of Samuel. In Judges 13, it was fasting that caused Samson to become conceived and thus to be made strong. In 1 King, Kingdoms, or 1 Kings, Elijah too fasted for 40 days and was made worthy to experience God, St. Basil says, as far as it was possible for man in this life upon Mount Horeb. In the same book, St. Basil says that it was fasting which granted Elijah power over death, raising the widow's son. And further, that it was fasting mixed with prayer that gave him power to shut the heavens and cause a drought for three years and six months. And thus, during that drought, the people who were far from God in their unrighteousness and sin were forced to fast, teaching them to call upon the Lord with what? With prayer and fasting in order to correct their ways. In 2 Kingdoms 4, Elisha was able to save the sons of the prophets by neutralizing a poison that they had consumed. St. Basil tells us it was through the prayers of Elisha who had fasted. Esther fasted not just for herself, but on behalf of her whole people. <coughs> Daniel neither ate bread nor drank anything for three weeks. And through this, St. Basil says again, he not only fasted, but he taught someone else to fast. Who did he teach to fast? The lions! <laughs> because the lions refused to touch him. This was through the power of fasting. Of course, the people of Nineveh turned God's wrath away from them, made God repent. What caused God to repent? Prayer and fasting. To these, we could add a lot of other examples, but you see here that fasting was an aid and empowerment to the prophets and a healing balm to the people of the Old Testament. What about the New Testament? Of course, the chief example we would give in the New Testament is Jesus Christ himself, who right after his baptism was driven by the Spirit into the desert and fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And fasting for him became a weapon against the temptations of the devil. To prepare Christ, John the Baptist preached repentance with a power born by prayer and fasting. The apostles in the book of Acts would pray and fast continually, and this would open them to the direct guidance of the Holy Spirit, such as in the beginning of Acts 13. St. Paul refused to set fasting aside even in times of great tumult. In 2 Corinthians 6.5, he lists fasting right after other things he endured. What did he endure? Beatings, imprisonments, tumults, labors, vigils. And then he lists fasting. He refused to set fasting aside even in those times. 
St. Basil makes a big deal out of the story of the rich man and Lazarus. It's an incredibly instructive story regarding fasting because we're told little about the rich man except what? That he feasted sumptuously. And we're told very little about Lazarus except that he fasted to the extent that he would have been happy with the very crumbs that fell from the table of the rich man. In fasting, Lazarus opened up paradise. In feasting without fasting, the rich man opened up the gates of hell. We see something particularly interesting in Matthew 9.15. Jesus, in this verse, is asked why his disciples are not fasting. And he answers this. Can guests of a wedding mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. In other words, it's an expectation from Christ that his followers would fast. This is Christ's own expectation for us. This is why I tell people, even if you don't understand fasting, fast and then you'll understand it. Because Christ himself told you to. Out of, out of love for Christ, be obedient to him. In Matthew 6, 16, Christ begins the verse, and when you fast. Again, it's an assumption of Christ that his followers will fast. He didn't say if you fast, he said when you fast. Fasting then is not an optional practice for the Christian. We are expected to fast by our very Lord. So why is fasting so important? What exactly is it really doing for us? I've already described this, this, uh, this idea of asceticism, that we want to starve the old man and we want to feed the new man. But what exactly does that look like? The example I gave in, the cat in Catechism number 10 is what I'll, I'll give here. And that's that man properly ordered looks like this. God is our head, who we want to follow in all things. We want to have a pure soul for our Lord, and we use the body to serve that soul. So whatever we do in the body, we want to keep pure so that I can serve the soul, so that we find purity of soul, so that we can properly serve God. Is that how we typically live? No, we live flipped over. We typically give everything to the body that it wants. If the body wants sleep, we give it to it. If the body wants food, we give it to it. If the body wants drink, we give it to it. If the body wants intimacy, we give it to it. If the body wants constant TV, we give it to it. Again and again, we give everything to the body. And then, every now and then, we give a little bit to the soul. We're kind of like Lazarus. We give him the crumbs from the table. And God is an afterthought. So what does fasting do? Fasting forcibly writes this. It says, that body that I'm constantly feeding and constantly giving all my attention to... I'm going to say no to. I'm going to make it uncomfortable. And in its discomfort, I'm going to ignore its cries. I'm going to put the body down. Then I'm going to use this period of fasting to pray and feed the soul. And in all this, I'm going to try to be obedient and serve my Lord. Fasting writes an upside down man. It causes us to be rightly ordered. In the ordering of ourselves, we see that fasting battles away demons. As we sacrifice ourselves and our comfort for Christ and starve the old man, the man of the flesh, grace comes in. So while we starve the old man of food, we feed the new man with grace. And what does that grace do? Grace drives away demons. This is why we're told in the Gospels, right? The apostles say, why couldn't we drive this one out? This one only goes out with what? With prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting will drive away the demons. And with the demons leaving, many of the passions themselves are withered. The fathers speak of fasting as driving out especially particular passions. This is one section that I was going to spend a lot more time on and give you quotes from the fathers, but we're already way past the half hour I was hoping to do, so I'm not going to give you all the quotes. I'll just tell you in a list the passions that mainly are battled with fasting. If you struggle with lust, fasting severely weakens lust. It also severely weakens anger. People who struggle with a lot of anger find that when they fast a lot and use fasting with contrition and contrite prayer, they find that their levels of anger go down. Fasting also battles acquisitiveness or greed. If we're constantly collecting things and we're very obsessed with the things of this world, well, guess what? The most necessary thing for us, food, if we deny ourselves, suddenly we fall out of, out of love with this world and suddenly we become less acquisitive. And finally, fasting humbles us. We realize that we really are nothing, that we really are very weak in the spiritual life, and so fasting is a great battler of pride. Reading any 
nearly any patristic text that speaks about how to battle these passions, you will find fasting mentioned as a strong and necessary weapon. Almost every father that talks about battling these passions, St. John Cassian, St. John Climacus, there's many, many uh, others, especially the Desert Fathers, they'll talk about the necessity of fasting. Fasting is then also limited or listed as an essential weapon, not only in battling the passions, but thus in acquiring the virtues. So the main virtues one finds being aided by fasting are, first of all, self-control. If you have an issue with self-control, fasting becomes a way that you learn self-control. And the more you practice fasting, the more you learn that you can have self-control in other areas of life. It also helps with meekness. Meekness, which is it's like a controlled strength that humbles us. Meekness is, is gained through fasting. Temperance. If we find that we're intemperate in things, we're constantly taking more than we need. Right? Fasting causes us. This, is, by the way, is one of the reasons that when you are fasting, if you're doing the conventional fast, even if you're eating a vegan diet, the fathers say, don't walk away completely full. Leave yourself a little hungry, and then you learn a lot of temperance in this. The way to do this, by the way, practically, I'll just tell you, I'm not going to get into a lot of practical advice for fasting, but here's one little piece of advice. Decide what you're going to eat before you eat it. When you're in the moment, you don't think about it. You start eating something, you go, man, this is really good. And you go into second or third helping. But if you decide ahead of time, you know what? This is my plate. I'm going to fill up half of it, and that's it. It'll help you with temperance. Fasting, believe it or not, a lot of the fathers say that wisdom is gained through fasting. Why wisdom? Because as we humble ourselves and put God as our head, suddenly we're more receptive to divine grace. And divine grace is the great teacher. What taught the apostles more than anything? Pentecost. They, listened, they, they, taught, they were taught by the, at the feet of Christ for three years. But Christ, ascend, or Christ resurrects, and they ask him what question. Are you going to establish the kingdom now? They still don't understand. They think that he's going to drive out the Romans and establish an earthly kingdom. Only after Pentecost, when they're illumined by the grace of the Holy Spirit, do they really understand what the kingdom actually is. So true wisdom. The fathers of the church gain wisdom. They learn the scriptures. What? Through prayer and fasting. Chastity. If it fights against lust, what does it instill in us? Chastity. Fasting really helps with chastity. I've had couples who really struggle with chastity. We, we, we should all strive for chastity. Chastity doesn't mean abstinence. It, it means rightly ordered intimate relationships. And many couples that I've, I've uh, who are having trouble with this, I've suggested, why don't you try fasting a little bit more? We created a plan, they found fasting really helps. Suddenly their desires started to be tempered. And finally, if fasting battles pride, what does it instill? Humility. Fasting absolutely helps us to gain humility over time. Really the greatest teacher of humility is suffering. And fasting, if we're doing it really well, is voluntary suffering. It teaches great humility. Throughout all the lives of the saints, 2,000 years, if we're not including the Old Testament prophets, we'd have even more. But for the 2,000 years of the church's existence, the dispassionate person, one who is not driven by passions but has gained a sort of angelic soul, is always described as one who fasts much. There's a great story from the life of St. Seraphim of Sarov. Do you remember this one? Deacon Zacchaeus just read a, a, a book I suggested on the life of St. Seraphim. It's called An Extraordinary Peace. I highly recommend it. It's a great life of St. Seraphim with his teachings. Do you remember the girl? I think it's in that one. The girl who comes to him asking about a guy and whether, whether she should marry him or not. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. So this, this girl goes to St. Seraphim and she says, well, I, you know, this, this man has been courting me and he wants to marry me and I want, I want to know whether I should say yes or not. And St. Seraphim asks one question. Does he fast? Does he keep the church's fast? That to him was an indication that this was a pious man who loved Christ and the church and would be a good husband. And if he didn't fast, his answer was no. That was the only question he asked. Does he follow the fasts of the church? So what do we do with our fasting? If all the saints of the Old Testament and the New Testament are full of these examples of fasting, these commands to fast, what do we do with it? The answer is, is you always combine fasting with prayer. If we're going to starve the old man, but not feed the new man, we've only done half the job. And when we only do half the job, what happens? The results are reversed. So I've known, I've seen people who do this, who come in, it's usually in the crazy convert period. If, you, if, I, if we haven't talked about the crazy convert period, I went through it. 
And it's when you really start paying attention to your faith and suddenly you know better than everyone. And this parish is patristic enough and this one is not. And this priest is doing the right things. This one is not. This monastery is good and this one's not. And you sit there and go, man, you're judging everybody but yourself. <coughs> and what about you? Are you praying? Well, no, I'm not praying. But, you know, I like, I like read one book so I know everything. You know? That's, that's the crazy convert period. Father Seraphim Rose says, if you're going through that, go into deep contrition and focus on yourself and your own heart. Stop, start worrying, stop worrying about everyone else. I went through this, believe me. And I had some priests really slam me for it. I thanked them for it. It was good for me. So what happens? If I wasn't praying, maybe I was fasting. But then what would the fasting do to me? Oh, I'm fasting so well. Oh, I'm so great. Look at me. I'm like the greatest ascetic ever to walk in the American soil. Of course, you know, I wasn't. You know, again, like how much time was I spending before my prayer corner? You know, two minutes, if that. So prayer with, or fasting without prayer is actually not a healthy thing for us. It may be good for a diet of the body, but it's not good. It's not good for the sanctity of the soul. So we always want to combine fasting with prayer. The fathers say that fasting gives wing to your prayer. What does that mean? That's something, again, like I talked about, you can really only know through experience. But I'll tell you that this is part of the reason for why fasting includes the certain foods that are listed and not other ones. People go, well, wait a minute, I can have shrimp. I can have, you know, mussels and things like that during, I can have clams, I can have lobster without butter, of course, so what, you know, that's not really worthwhile, but I can have these things during the fast. Why? Well, it's a very simple reason. Go eat a double bacon cheeseburger and then go pray. Fast for a day and then go have some shrimp and go pray. Are you going to notice a difference? You eat that double bacon cheeseburger and you're sluggish. You feel weighed down. You can't focus as well. Reminds me of this old Kevin James bit where he talks about as he got older and fatter, he'd eat just a few muffins and he'd feel like a tranquilized bear. <sighs> That's how I feel after a burger. But shrimp feels light. You know? So you eat some of these things, you feel lighter, and you don't feel as weighed down. This is why these foods were, were chosen in the first place. Oil, by the way. Why oil? Because oil traps in a lot of these nutrients. When you don't have oil, by the time you're, you're fasting Monday through Friday, by, fat, by Friday, you feel very tired. You feel like you really gave your body a beating, and on Saturday and Sunday when you can have wine and oil, suddenly you feel strengthened again. The fathers knew what they were talking about. So fasting will make your body not only feel lighter, but it also give a lot of wing to your prayer. And you'll feel, you'll sense this through experience, just trust me in this. The more you fast, the more you'll feel that your prayer lifts high and is pure and light and beautiful, and you're more focused in it. And as I said, fasting without prayer can become very prideful. So as you humble yourself before Christ, it brings out great contrition with your prayer. Fasting is a great aid to prayer. Do not miss out. Do not miss out during these great fast periods. When you increase your fasting, make sure you're increasing your prayer as well, especially the Jesus prayer. Well, how should we fast? And how should we not fast? Christ himself tells us. Matthew 6, 16 to 18. And when you fast... Do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have the reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by men, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who is in secret will reward you. Some translations say reward you openly. So we want to make sure that when we fast, we're not being dour about it. We're not telling people what a tough time we're having. We're not looking sad and depressed. Rather, we want to fast with some inward joy. St. John Chrysostom has a quote on this. It's a, a very famous quote from St. John Chrysostom that describes how when we fast, it needs to be a fast not only from food, but from sin altogether. If we're going to starve the old man, we need to starve the old man of all the things we're feeding the old man. Not just physical food, but of all the things that feed the senses in the wrong way. So this is a lengthy quote. Forgive me with my throat, I need to drink a lot of water. It's a lengthy quote, quote, but it's a famous one, a beautiful one. Dost thou fast, he asks? Give me proof of it by your works. Is it said by what kind of works? If thou sees a poor man, take pity on him. If thou sees an enemy, be reconciled to him. If thou sees a beautiful woman, pass her by. For let not the mouth only fast, but also the eye, and the ear, and the feet, and the hands, 
and all the members of our bodies. Let the hand fast by being pure from pillaging and avarice. Let the feet fast by ceasing from running to hate the hateful theater and along the pathways of sin. Let the eyes fast being taught never to fix themselves rudely upon handsome countenances or to busy themselves with strange beauties. For looking is the food of the eyes. But if this be such as is unlawful or forbidden, it mars the fast and upsets the whole safety of the soul. But if it be lawful and safe, it adorns fasting. For it would be among things the most absurd <coughs> to abstain from lawful food because of the fast, but with the eyes to touch even what is forbidden. Dost thou not eat flesh? Feed not upon lasciviousness by means of the eyes. Let the ear fast also. The fashion of the ear consists in refusing to receive evil speaking and calumnies. Let the mouth too fast from disgraceful speeches, speeches and railing. It's an incredible perspective on the spiritual life from St. John Chrysostom. There's one other quote I want to give you from St. Basil the Great. He's, this is from his first homily on fasting. Listen, listen to how, how, how exalted he views fasting. Fasting begets prophets and strengthens mighty men. Fasting makes lawgivers wise. It is a good guardian of the soul, a safe companion for the body, the best weapon, a training regimen for contestants. It drives away temptations. It readies for piety. It is the companion of sobriety and the craftsman of self-control. In war, it teaches bravery. In peace, stillness. It sanctifies the Nazarite and perfects the priest. For it is impossible to venture upon priestly... And I wrote the wrong word. <laughs> uh, priestly activities, I think is the word, without fasting. Not only in the case of our present holy and true worship, but also in the prefigured worship set out in the law. So in other words, in New Testament worship and Old Testament worship. If we understand even a part of this, we start to understand that fasting is not a punishment and it's not about deprivation. Fasting is a really beautiful gift. It's a gift that helps us. It's a weapon in the spiritual fight. Fasting is something that fills us rather than empties us. Fasting is about what we gain, not about what we lose. So if we make fasting all about the food that we just can't eat, it's miserable. If we make fasting just about the rules and the should, I just should fast, it becomes an obligation and becomes miserable. But if we make fasting about the gift it is to help aid the soul in seeking purity, we start to recognize it as a really beautiful gift and we embrace it. This is why every time Pascha comes, there's always a little bit of sadness in me because I know how much I benefit from the fast and I know that I don't have that self-control. When I see that dead animal, I'm going to go after it. <laughs> I'm going to consume it. Can you imagine if we didn't have fasting in the spiritual life? We wouldn't have as many saints as we have. And the Christian life itself would be more difficult. Fighting against the passions and fighting for the virtues would be made incredibly, exponentially more difficult. And imagine that if in this difficulty we were struggling and we just said, Christ, no matter how much I try, I can't stop doing these things. I can't gain these virtues. I can't do anything. And then Christ appeared to us, just personally. He appeared right here before us and said, I'm going to tell you a secret. I'm going to, I'm going to give you a gift in the spiritual life. I'm going to give you this great tool and weapon called fasting. And he taught us how to fast, when to do it, how deep to go with it, and how to combine it with prayer. Every time we'd fast... We'd fast with gratitude and fervor and joy with the thought of how it's growing us closer to Christ. This is how we should see fasting. We should see it as a great gift and a secret of the spiritual life that's been given to the Orthodox Church and that we want to embrace as fully as possible. So do not, do not, do not, do not see fasting as a burden. Do not see fasting as a burden and don't take this gift that Christ has offered us and have ingratitude towards it. St. John Chrysostom has the simplest and my favorite quote on fasting. He simply says, for the Christian, fasting is feasting. For the Christian, fasting is feasting. When we fast, we feast in soul. We feel that lightness to our prayer. We see it battling the passions. 
And we feel great joy at this because we know that we're living a, a life that is not sorrowing Christ so much anymore, but is rather pleasing him. For the Christian, fasting is feasting. This is how we ought to fast. So fast well. Okay, with that very long talk compared to what I was planning on, any questions? Tasiana. So, I thought it would say no oil, you mean olive oil. Okay. Correct? <laughs> I get this question all the time, and I never really know. So the question is, is when it says no oil, is that just olive oil? I mean, you can have olives, but you're not supposed to have olive oil. So what do we do with that? And we also have all these other types of oils. What I tell people is this. The, the letter says no olive oil. So if you want to cook with other oils, you can. If you want to go a step deeper into the fast, understand the spirit behind no oil. And that means we're eating simple and uncooked food for the most part. And so having meals that are fruits, steamed veggies, you know, nuts and simple grains, um, you know, things like that is a good way to go and it's a good it's a good thing to shoot for. But if you're just starting off, just start off with no olive oil and just, you know, leave it at that. Okay. Labels. Do I read them? Or yeah. Not? Okay. <laughs> That's another question. You're going to get different answers from different priests on whether to read labels or not. Some priests out there say, say that if you are reading a label, you're being pharisaical about the fast. I guess I'm a Pharisee then. I disagree. And the reason I disagree is because what goes into your food goes into the body. And when we don't eat these things, like I say, we don't feel as weighed down. I don't think looking at labels is necessarily a bad thing. Here's where I think that you don't want to be pharisaical. If I have in my hands two bagels, two bags of bagels, and I want to buy a bagel for the fast period. And on one of them, it has eggs. But eggs is the very last thing on the list, which means there's very little of it. It's probably just used to put a glaze in the top or something like that. And then I have the vegan bagel, which costs twice as much. I didn't talk about this today. I talked about it in the, in the other lecture. But part of fasting is, is you're saving, funny, uh, saving money on food. And that, that money should be what? Given out of alms. Alms giving is part of fasting as well. So do I want to pay two or three times for the, for the officially vegan bagels? Or do I want to get the bagels where eggs are the very last thing in the, the ingredients and it's probably barely noticeable? I'd probably get the ones with the eggs in them and save the money. And again, we should be giving an alms. So I don't think looking at labels is a bad thing. I think we should look at labels, but we have to use a little bit of discretion there and recognize. There's also the other way you can go, and you can look at something like Oreos and go, oh my goodness, Oreos don't have dairy in them. I can just have Oreos every day. Is that really fasting? No, <laughs> no. So you want to be cautious that just because something may be, may be uh, according to the letter fasting, according to the law, it doesn't really work. You know, when I was in, when I was in um, uh, my first year of college, I went on a little road trip and uh, it was, I was going out during a fast period. And my friend looked in the car and he goes, huh, Pringles, gummies, bears, sodas? He goes, stick into the fast really good, huh? And I was like, well, none of that's dairy, you know? But he made a good point. Yeah, is that really fasting? No, it's not really fasting. I'm, I'm eating a bunch of junk. So I, I like the rule for myself. I like to take, cut out as much sugar as possible um, during the fast periods because it's just good for us. So looking at labels, I think, is actually a good thing to do. But again, you don't want to go too far with that. You want to have a balance there, balance and everything. Jezebel. Um, Three questions. My first question is, um, you said that every body is the spirit of God. Why do you strive to it for an incorruptible crown of glory rather than just doing the correct thing for the sake of doing the correct thing? Okay, so in striving after the asceticism and trying to feed the spirit, why do we strive for an incorruptible crown? Because instead of just doing the thing because God calls us to it, is that essentially what you're asking? Because there's motivations for the spiritual life. And for some of us, just doing what God asks because he, because he asks it is sometimes we're just weak. It's not good enough. And so St. Paul there is using uh, exactly what Christ used and reminding people that there are beautiful things and treasures in heaven that we're striving for. And so if nothing else motivates you, you remind yourself of that. And he also uses that to compare the two. And he's, well, the reason he says that is, He's saying, if, if striving for an incorruptible crown, someone's willing to deny themselves all these things, then shouldn't we who are striving for a much greater and incorruptible crown be able to do the same and even more? And that, that was his point with that. But yes, if we did everything just purely out of love for Christ, that would be ideal. But we're not there yet all the time. And by the way, we go through those stages all the time. Most days I try to do things out of love for Christ, but sometimes mm, I'm just being super selfish. And so what do I remind myself of? The two other motivations, rewards of heaven or the threat of hell. And those things may make may kind of like kick me into gear. So Christ gives us all three motivations, but ideally, yes, love for Christ is the ideal. Okay. Um, why, why don't um, the Slavs follow and strictly fast during, during fast periods? They'll be a little bit more liberal with their shoes and stuff. 
why don't the, Slav the Slavic countries follow as strict a, a fast? I, I think it depends on which country and which parish and which person, honestly. Some of the, um, some of the Russian Orthodox that I know are actually fast much more strictly than I'm used to. Um, they'll, they'll fast, um, you know, always with only one meal a day before they receive community. They receive communion sometimes a lot less, only a few times a year. They'll fast sometimes for multiple days beforehand. So I really don't know, it, in, except that it probably depends on, on the land that they're in and, and certain historical contexts. So it would depend on each particular circumstance. What do you mean? I, I don't know what you mean by people talking about fasting. What, what do you mean? I hear folks... Talk. Like this talk? No. Okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> no, I mean, like just in normal conversation, talking about the fast or what they fast, what they ate for fasting. Or... So the question is, why, why, do, why do we hear people talking about fasting? Shouldn't we? Ideally, yes, we do it quietly. However, I, I would say this, that in the American context where fasting, even within the Orthodox Church, is not always taken very seriously. I had, I had one parish where um, I was visiting during Lent, and the the priest, this this really, it, it, it upset me uh, quite a bit. I, I understand the motivations, so I'm not trying to judge the priest, but it upset me. He looked at his parishioners and said, I know none of you are really going to fast, so what I'd like you to do is cut out one meal or one snack a day, think about how much money that will save you, and then come put that money in the basket and we'll give it to the poor. And I went, oh, like, why, why not hold people to a high standard and, like, shoot for this? And I think that within the American context, when, when a lot of people are not fasting, and fasting is such a foreign concept, that people like to kind of, they get excited about it when they actually do it, and they like to encourage one another in it. So hopefully that's the motivation of why people talk about it. Ideally, when we get to a point where we don't mention it, we don't, like, like the life of St. Mary of Egypt, where St. Zosima and his monastery, they go out, and no one talks about what they did during those 40 days. Yeah, that would be ideal. That would be ideal. At the same time, we do need encouragement because we, we live in a, in a world of such temptation. I suspect that fasting was a lot easier when there was no such thing as a supermarket and you couldn't just go and pick whatever you wanted. And so some people need that encouragement. Okay, any other questions? Yes. It's a good question, yeah. So she's asking about a lot of people when they, uh, we can think of any spiritual practice, if I haven't prayed or if I've, I've sinned some great way, but a lot of times with fasting, you break the fast in the morning, you just weren't thinking, oh, my, I didn't even think it's Wednesday. I had eggs, I had, I had bacon. And then a lot of people will go, well, the whole day's a goner now. I might as well just throw away the whole day. And so I'm just not going to fast for the rest of the day. How do I know people do this? Because I've done it, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Years ago, when I was in college, that was like my go-to. Like, oh, I missed out. I had, I, I had some meat. I might as well just have it for the rest of the day. And the question is, well, how do you pick yourself up? How do you not get down on yourself in that in that uh, point? This is why I, lately you've heard me a lot, uh, like repeatedly pushing this thing not to live the spiritual life for yourself, but to live it for Christ. When you're living it for yourself, you can look at. I mean, I, I don't know why we put the whole spiritual life in in terms of like these twenty-four hour days, but we do. We go, well, this day's a goner. I might as well just throw the whole day out. When you're living the spiritual life for Christ, what happens is you fall and you say, oh, Lord, I was thoughtless. I sorrowed you. Forgive me. But there's still daylight left. There's still time. And I want to make sure that I offer some part of this day to you. And this is the same way we would treat, you know, one another. Like, there's no other. I, don't, I can't think of any other relationship where we do this, you know. Like, my wife and I fight in the morning, and I go, well, I might as well just not be married for the rest of the day. Dun, 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 you know, like, <laughs> where's that old girlfriend's number? No one does that. No one does that. You know? What we do is we go, I don't want to come home and still be fighting. 
I'm going to buy her some flowers and try to make up and I want to please her. And she may, maybe we haven't quite settled this yet, but at the very least, I want her to know that I love her even within this fight. So this is how we should really treat Christ, is that we're living the spiritual life primarily for him and not for ourselves. And if we're doing so, then we have, when we have a fall, we treat it like a relationship. And we say, I messed up. Please forgive me. <clears throat> we bow down, we do a prostration, whatever, whatever we need to do to kind of right ourselves with God, and then we get back on track. Why? Because we love him and we know he loves us. Good question. Any other questions? Yes. This is throwing me for a loop, so forgive me, Father. But... Repentance is turning towards Christ, mm -hmm. but you said in your talk that people repented and then, or the people fasted and then God repented. Yeah, yeah. So how does God turn towards Himself? I, yeah. So the the question is, is if if repentance is turning towards God, and sin is turning away from Him, how how could we say that God repented? By the way, it's not my language. The Bible's language. <laughs> and, and, and the answer is, is that the scriptures constantly give an anthropomorphic language to God. And so another example of this is, you know, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And we go, well, then, then how is Pharaoh guilty? Because God did it. But we have to understand that from our perspective, God becomes angry or is happy with us. But from God's perspective, he just loves us perfectly. How do we experience that love? How did, how did Pharaoh's heart become hardened? Well, the fathers say, your heart can be like wax or like clay. Pharaoh decided to make his heart like clay so that when the light of, of God shone upon it, it didn't soften it like wax, but hardened it and cracked it like clay. And so when we say that God repented, all it means is that God had planned to do a certain thing and the, the, the Ninevites literally changed his mind. In other words, his plan was no longer necessary because the very thing that he was hoping to get from them repentant hearts where it was no longer necessary and so from their perspective they changed god's mind did he know what they were going to do of course he knew what they were going to do ahead of time so we use the language that god repented because it helps us understand this great mystery of who god is who never ceases to love us does that help understand it because if god knew and then yeah well, this is, yeah, this is like God is outside of time. It'll make you crazy if you start delving into that. These are the, these are the questions where you just go, I'm just going to trust that uh, God knows what he's doing. And live by repentance. Uh, St. Anthony, I think I mentioned the catechism class. St. Anthony asked, you know, how, how is it that some people are, are so wicked and yet they have such easy lives and some people are so righteous and yet they have horrible lives and how could God, you know, allow this to happen here and this to happen there and how, do, how does it all make sense? And God answered him and said, Anthony, is your mind, is my mind your mind? Can you possibly understand my providence? You focus on yourself and your repentance. Let me take care of the rest. Yes. Father Paul, can you maybe briefly touch upon how to begin to fast? Is it uh, with prayer or reading some scripture or um, just mindful of uh, the church calendar? Yeah, so how do, how do you begin the fast in just a very practical sense? Yes, sir. Well, when it comes to the, um, the, the fast of Great and Holy Lent, we begin it with forgiveness vespers. Uh, it's really important that we begin with forgiveness because if you go and not having forgiven others, we're told in the scriptures, if you forgive others, God will forgive you. If you don't, he's going to treat you with the same way that you treat others, the same way you treat others. So this is why we never approach communion or a fast having resentment and anger in our hearts towards others. In, in any other case, the, the fasts are entered just, like I said, with more prayer um, and with cognizance of our own sin. So hopefully we're, we're a, a bit more contrite on those days. Hopefully we're aware of the reasons for the fast so we can aim the fast properly. We know on Wednesday it's because of the betrayal of Christ. We have to consider how we betrayed him. Friday, because of the crucifixion, we have to realize we've done that. The apostles fast because the apostles sacrificed everything to give us this great faith, and yet we treat it like it's not this great gift. We treat it like a burden. And so hopefully we fast out of, out of, out of love. But um, this is really it, is that it's, it's based more in the spirit of how we fast than, than anything else. And again, different fast periods, there's different things to focus on. All right. Thank you so much for your attention. I know that was much longer than I planned. That's right. Oh, one other question. Um, oh, I know. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Just. But I, I was wondering, like, should I know you're very busy, and there are times. So I'm, I'm asking kind of for the room. Should we get a specific blessing from you for, for a particular approach to a fast, or if we're just going to do the standard or what we did last fast? 
do we need to reconfirm that with you or how do we handle yeah. getting a blessing for the fast? Okay, so uh, the, the question is how do we get a blessing for a fast, especially if we're just beginning. I've told all the catechumens you've seen in the catechumen packet that when you're just starting off, make sure and get a blessing if you've never eaten a vegan diet before and I'm gonna kind of wean you up to it. For a long fast, like, like the Lent, Lenten fast, I can get you to fast in the way the church calls you to by the last week or two, but you don't want to start off that way because if you if you go too far too fast, what happens is you make yourself sick and then you learn to detest rather than love fasting. I want you to love fasting and see it as a gift and see it as a help in your in your soul, in your spiritual life. So you want to wean yourself into it, so you'll talk to me. And then once you get to that, that, that uh, place, if you can just hold the fast by the letter, you do it that way. Anything you want to go beyond that, it's a, it's a wise thing just to come and talk to me first. Because you want to make sure, again, you're not doing too much too soon. So I've had people say, you know, is it okay if I try to go for one meal a day? And typically I say, yes. But if you say, hey, can I go for one meal every other day? I might go, mm, let's try one meal a day first and see how you do. And then we'll kind of go to this. And also, you know, what are you doing about water? Are you drinking? Like there's questions to go in, in this because some people get in their, in their uh, zeal. They want to go a little bit too far too fast. And that can actually be dangerous. This is why... Fasting is as obedience to God also means that we should be cutting off our will and I've, I've had to tell some people No, I won't let you fast that way and they go, but father. I'm trying really hard here. I want to do it. And I go. Yeah, but Look, you're getting angry at me <laughs> Which means that maybe some humility and obedience might be a really good thing to learn here And so no, I'm not gonna let you fast the way you want yet, but try this first obedience is higher Now does that come up that often? No, not that often and I don't want to be too involved in those things, you know, but um, like, you know, if, you, if you're at someone's house and they made something and it has some oil in it, you don't need to text me and go, can I, can I have a blessing for this? Just eat it. We'll talk about it later. It's not going to be that big of a deal, <laughs> you know, so we don't want to go too, too far with this. But yeah, if we're going to try to fast beyond just the letter of what we're called to, it's good to talk. Okay. All right. Stretching, not a question. Yeah, yes. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> thank, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you again for uh, the use of your home, uh, Doug and Jill. Uh, this has been been great. Um, you're you're welcome to still mingle and talk and get please get to know each other, get to know each other's names. I'm gonna head back to church because I've got a meeting in about ten minutes anyway. So may God bless and keep you. Thank you all. <clears throat>